this time of year, a lot of things are going on. It's a time of year when parents and the secular world has their eyes on monsters and ghosts, vampires, devils, witches, ghouls, and they encourage people, parents encourage their children to dress up like these things and to go from door to door asking for candy and treats. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, we were going from door to door asking people to come to hear the Word of God. And for the most part, we weren't received very well. I think, Ed, somebody was pretty rude to you. I, I was within earshot. Zach was at a door, and, and the lady said, you know, I'm not interested. Don't come back. Um, I've been very fortunate. I don't know if it's because I shocked them with this face, but when I go to the door, people tend to smile, and they were receptive. But not one person that I invited at the door came. Not one. But when these young people go to the door dressed in these hideous costumes and outfits and knock on the door, people come to the door bearing gifts, giving them candy and, and treats. The, the homeowners actually decorate their houses so to, as to attract these kids to the homes. They leave their lights on at night so that they'll come. They put black cats out, ghosts, goblins, carved pumpkins, all of these things. So when the kids see those things, they say, hey, there's a house full of candy, let's go there. And they walk from house to house, sometimes for hundreds of yards, maybe even for a mile or more, collecting candy and getting all these things. And a lot of times you'll find that the adults, even though, even though there might may, may be no children in their home, you'll go into a, uh, maybe a supermarket or into a store, and you'll find people dressed up in all these different outfits and have all these you know, just tons of paint on them, painting themselves to look like something they're not. So why, it sounds kind of bizarre when you paint it like that, you know, when you talk about it that way, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound kind of strange? Why are people into this so much? What causes this particular thing to be so popular? And we go to the door with God's word and, well, I'm not interested. Don't come back here again. But if I come dressed as this hideous little monster, oh, come on in, come on, get your little treats. That seems odd, at least from the perspective of someone who's living by the word of God, it just, it just seems strange. Why would anyone celebrate a holiday emphasizing something that's morbid? And where did it originate? Well, I want you to notice uh, what the Encyclopedia of Religion says. The Encyclopedia of Religion, it's on the PowerPoint here. It says, Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, is a festival celebrated on October 31st, the evening prior to the Christian feast of all saints. Halloween is the name for the eve of, it's actually Samhain. I always thought that was Sam Hain, but it's Samhain. I looked it up a celebration marking the beginning of winter as well as the first day of the new year within the ancient Celtic culture of the British Isles. The time of Samhain consisted of the eve of the feast of the day itself, October 31st and November 1st, and it continues. On this occasion, it was believed that the gathering of supernatural forces occurred as during no other period of the year. The eve and day of Samhain were characterized as a time when barriers between the human and supernatural worlds were broken. Otherworldly entities, such as the souls of the dead, were able to visit earthly inhabitants, and humans could take the opportunity to penetrate the domains of the gods and supernatural creatures. Why would anyone want to do something like this? But it, it continues. Fiery tributes and sacrifices of animals, crops, and possibly human beings were made to appease supernatural powers and control the fertility of the land. Samhain acknowledged the entire spectrum of non-human forces that roam the earth during the period. The Encyclopedia Britannica, the 15th edition, on volume four, page 862, says this under the heading Halloween. 
just a moment. I saw the mouse moving around. Just a moment. Can you move that mouse, please, off of the bottom? There you go. Just leave it right there, please. It says, huge bonfires were set on hilltops to frighten away evil spirits. The souls of the dead were supposed to revisit their homes on this day, and the autumnal festival acquired sinister significance with ghosts, witches, I, I've never heard of hobgoblins, but there it is. Black cats, fairies, and demons of all kinds said to be roaming about. It was the time to placate the supernatural powers controlling the processes of nature. And it continues. In addition, Halloween was thought to be the most favorable time for divinations concerning marriage, luck, health, and death. It was the only day on which the help of the devil was invoked for such purposes. Unbelievable. And the vast majority of people, at least in this country, in the United States, welcome this kind of thing. Perhaps in ignorance, perhaps not knowing. Just like Christmas and Easter, a lot of church leaders have adopted this ancient celebration to serve their own purposes, to bring people into the church. I think I told you that uh, back in 2013, I was invited to a church. I went to that church. I walked in and hanging from the ceiling in their fellowship hall were witches on brooms and ghosts and goblins in a church. And when I mentioned it to one of the people there, they, we walked out and and I mentioned it, well, I didn't even notice that. So we walked back in, and sure enough, there it was. Are we not paying attention? You see, that happens. We get so focused on other things that we don't pay attention to those little details. That can happen in a ministry like this, and we have to be very cautious. We have to be very careful. We have to remind each other of these things. We have to remind each other. Back to the Encyclopedia of Religion. It continues on. Just one more slide here. It says, Samhain remained a popular festival among the Celtic people throughout the characterization of Great Britain. The British church attempted to divert this interest in pagan customs by adding a Christian celebration to the calendar on the same date as Samhain. The Christian festival, the Feast of All Saints, commemorates the known and unknown saints of the Christian religion, just as Samhain had acknowledged and paid tribute to the Celtic deities. So, when we look at that, they're trying to offset it with something that they think is good. It's good to do good things, but if we're doing it on that day, what do we do? You know, several ancient Halloween practices exist in modern observances. I want to let you know that this Celtic church, remember we've talked in the past about St. Patrick, and he was one of these people, but he freed from a lot of those pagan beliefs, and he came to know the one true God, and he recognized the Sabbath day, and he recognized the state of the dead, so he naturally wouldn't be celebrating these, and, and acknowledging that these dead people, quote unquote, are, are walking around. But some of these observances, believe it or not, I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, I've seen people do it. Have you ever heard of bobbing for apples? And you've seen these, you go to sometimes fall festivals is where they, they do these things. I don't know if you realize it or not, but that's actually rooted in divination and fortune telling. And what they would do is they would bob for the apples and the first person to bite an apple was predicted to marry in the coming year. It was all a way of, sometimes they would use it even to find a, a marriage mate. The jack-o'-lantern that you see on the front porch is carved up with the face on it. That came from a watchman on Halloween night who was caught between the earth and the supernatural world and it was keeping guard of the house. It was to scare off the scary demons. So even things like when you, when you look at a lot of the old architecture has, for example, uh, in New York City, some of the churches have gargoyles on the top of them that are supposed to keep the evil spirits away. Well, if you ask me, that's attracting them. They love those things. They want to see those things. And it's sad that, that the majority of the world, including Christ, Christians, they, they actually dismiss any kind of symbolism that's demonic. 
We tend to justify it sometimes. Well, it's okay if I watch this show. There's just a little bit of badness in it. Or it's okay if I read this book, even though the cover's got this demon on the front. It's not really about demons. I'll read it anyway. Or it's okay if I go to this website because it, you see? So, so we, we begin to compromise. We begin to take something that we think is harmless fun and it can actually hinder our relationship with our Heavenly Father. The Bible reveals that there are evil spirits. It reveals that. And it reveals who leads them. Let's take a look here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives not just a few, but the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He deceives the whole world. We live in this world, friends. We're, we're bombarded every day. No matter how spiritual, no matter how close our walk with Christ is, we have to be careful. We can't think, well, I've got, I've got the armor of Christ. That's my bulletproof vest. I can walk into any situation. No, we can't do that. We have to be careful who we associate with, how we associate with them, the things that we bring into our lives, the things we watch, the things we listen to, the things we read. Every sense that we have, Satan tries to enter in through all five of our senses. Think about it that way. He's trying to enter your mind through any way he can. And he uses every one of our five senses to do it. So we have to be cautious. We have to have that armor of God, which is Christ Jesus. The Apostle John also tells us this in 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. See, so we're given multiple warnings that through these customs, through these things that seem subtle, through these little ways, Satan's trying to get in. You know, we've always said that Jesus knocks, but Satan beats the door down. He forces his way, and this is what he wants to do. He wants to blind us, to cause us to minimize anything that displeases God. He wants us to make some kind of an excuse to not follow the word, but to follow anything else, anything or anybody else. That's what he does. You know, as a loving father, God wants us to avoid anything that hurts us. doesn't matter what it is, how large or how small. I want you to notice concerning the spirit world, what it says in the Old Testament, even. Leviticus 19.31, it says, You shall not turn to mediums, and you shall not seek to spirit knowers to be defiled by them. I am Jehovah your God. And also in Deuteronomy, take a look at this. Deuteronomy 18.10-12, through 12, There shall not be found in you one who passes his son or daughter through the fire, one that uses divination, an observer of clouds, or one divining, or a whisperer of spells, or a magic charmer, or one consulting mediums, or a spirit knower, or one inquiring of the dead. For all doing these things are an abomination to Jehovah. And because of these filthy acts, Jehovah your God is dispossessing these nations before you. Boy, that's a lot. Filthy acts, he calls them. And think about it. Think about the last time that you had the television on and there wasn't some kind of a point within 10 minutes that there was something demonic. Within five minutes. Look even at the commercials loaded with this stuff. And, and we just minimize it. We minimize it. Now, this here in this verse, if you notice, right at the beginning, it says, there, there shall not be found in you anyone who passes his son or his daughter through the fire. This is a reference to the fire found in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy. I want you to notice this. It says, Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 31, it says, When Jehovah your God shall cut off the nations from before you, where you are going to, in to possess them, and you shall possess them and shall live in their land. Take heed to yourself. Don't worry about everybody else. We have a tendency to do that. 
Take heed to yourself that you not be snared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? And, how, and I shall do like so, I'm sorry, and I shall do so, even I. So there, don't be curious about how they're serving their gods. The next verse says, verse 31, you shall not do so to Jehovah your God, for everything hateful to Jehovah, which he detests, they have done to their gods, for they have even burned their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. So you see what this is saying? This is speaking about Molech. That's what this is speaking of. And, and there's no doubt that both the, among the Ammonites and the Phoenicians that this was taking place. How do I know this is speaking about Molech? Let's take a look here, Jeremiah chapter 32. It says, And they built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech which I did not command them, nor did I come into my heart. And they, shall, they should do this, that they should do this detestable thing to cause Judah to sin. The point is, God calls his people to a different standard than the world. We're held to a higher standard. Our lives are better as a result of following what the Bible says rather than following what the world says. Instead of superstitious, things, instead of these myths, instead of following the nations, as he says not to do, God asks us to look to him for our blessings, to look to him for direction, to look to him for what the future holds. Don't go to fortune tellers. Don't go to these, these people of divin divination. Don't go there. Stay away from those things. You know, and, and I want you to think about it. These things that we're looking at here are in the Old Testament. And so many people would dismiss it just because it's in the Old Testament. The Bible is cohesive. It all goes together. What applied to them applies to us. It's no different. It's no different. Sometimes modern celebrations of Halloween on the surface, and people might look in the world, they look at it and say, it's just, it's just harmless fun. All I'm doing is dressing up. Well, I'll just dress up like the president. That's harmless. Or I'll just dress up like so-and-so, like a movie star. You see, people do that stuff. And they say, well, I'm not dressing up like a ghost or a goblin or a ghoul or any of these things. I'm dressing up like a celebrity. But really, is that who you are? When you dress up like a celebrity, what does that celebrity represent? Are they a person of God? Whose clothing are we to have on? <coughs> Whose image are we to portray? Not a movie star, not a president, not a, a sports figure. But we're supposed to have Christ. When people see us, they should see Christ Jesus. That's the way it should be. And, and our actions are what tell them who we hang around. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The things that we talk about tell who we're in close association with the things that we love to do. So to some, this Halloween seems harmless. It seems like there's nothing wrong with it at all. But the spiritual implications of dabbling in the spirit world are extremely serious. You know, we ask for the spirit of God. We ask for the spirit of his son, Christ Jesus. That's the spirit that we want. That's the spirit we imitate. All of these things, and they're so subtle, fortune-telling. People have a game called a Ouija board. Some people think it's harmless fun. I have friends that are Christian people that have the Ouija board in their home. Oh, it's just harmless. But you're asking for trouble. If you're bringing that into your house, you're asking for it. You're asking these demons to come into your life. Astrology. Well, it doesn't hurt. Let me just look at my, uh, at my uh, what do they call it in the newspaper? Horoscope. Yeah, let me just look. Let me look and say, oh boy, let's see. Well, what are you doing? 
So many people look, I know Christians that look at these things. Oh, that doesn't mean anything to me. Then why are you looking at it? See, that's the question. And really, sometimes when people read things, it puts a, plants a seed in their mind. So now they might change the course of their day based on something that they read there that's just pure conjecture. And they'll change their whole lifestyle for it. Things in the, in the islands especially, I'm sure Sister Pamela, voodoo is huge in the island area. This is, a, this is big, and it's growing more and more in, in this country. Uh, these clairvoyant people that say, oh, well, here, let me just, let me just look at your palm, or, or wait a minute, I think I know what you're thinking. I, I, I'm, I'm getting a sense of something. Black magic, all of these things are related to demonism, spiritism, and the occult. All of them are related. And whenever we bring anything like that into our lives, when we let it come in through the television set or through the computer, in our homes, we're opening the door. We're, we're opening the door to say, okay, here I am, come and get me. You know, and I've even had people say, well, the Bible doesn't mention Halloween. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mention Halloween. But the origins of it, the things that we're talking about now, the things that these encyclopedias and dictionaries say, the modern customs show that this is something that's based on, even on false beliefs, because it's talking about the dead. It's talking about the dead coming to life and walking, the walking dead. That's a TV show. I can't believe the popularity of that. There's a new program now called Evil. Tanya had the news on the other week, and they were promoting this show. I think it's, I think it came, I think it's already on, I don't know. But she says, that commercial, I have to turn the TV off. The commercial was terrifying, just the way that they do it. And people are lining up to watch this stuff. They get top ratings. It's just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But these celebrations are, are and things are based on false teachings of the dead. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm going to begin, I want to read several verses here. You know, we, this, the, the Bible is just an amazing, it's an amazing uh, tool that we have. And I hope that you read from it every day. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 14, it says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to wise men as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing in verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless is not the, is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, through though many, are one bread and one body, for we are all are partakers of that one bread. So I ask the question, what should we be celebrating? What should we celebrate? Oh, we can celebrate the Sabbath. Rick mentioned that to me earlier. We can celebrate the Sabbath. We, a lot of times when we first learn about the Sabbath, we think of it as a day of don'ts. Didn't that come up in Sabbath school? But what can we do? We can praise our Heavenly Father. We can shout from the rooftops and tell others about it. We can witness to people. We can spend time with each other in fellowship, in nature. And when I look at these things, what this is telling me is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is, in a nutshell, these verses are telling us, if I continue, look at verse 17. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Well, who is that bread? That's Jesus. Verse 18, Observe, Israel, after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or that what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. This is very clear. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. 
or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? See, anything that's in your life that points us in the direction of doing wrong, this is saying you can't do that and serve God at the same time. You can't. But for some reason, even in my mind, honestly, I try to justify it. Oh, well, just watching this one thing isn't going to hurt me. I've done it. But the closer our walk becomes with Christ, the more we realize, you know, I've got, these things have to be, they've got to be put aside. They've got to be put behind me. What did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Right? I don't even want to face you. Get behind me. So when I look at these texts, when I look at texts like this, it's just, it's amazing to me that God is just begging us. He's calling us to just, just follow my will. That's all, that's all he wants. And at this time of year, people are just roused. I can't believe the people that are stirred by this. This has got to be one of the worst holidays there is. It has to be. According to the book Halloween and American Holiday, this is what it says. It says, some of the Celts were, wore ghoulish costumes so that wandering spirits would mistake them for one of their own or leave them alone. So that's where it came from. It says, others offered sweets to the spirits to appease them. Oh, you give me a piece of candy, I'm happy, right? But this is where these things, this is what they're rooted in. It says, in medieval Europe, the Catholic clergy adopted local pagan customs and had their adherents go from house to house wearing costumes and requesting small gifts. So it came from the Catholic Church. Isn't it amazing the things you can uncover if you just start looking? And, and this isn't just Googling stuff. This, these are encyclopedias. These are, these are things that pe people know that they understand. A lot of these things are right from history. A lot of them are. I want you to take a look at this. This is from the World Book Encyclopedia. The Celts believed that the dead could walk among the living at this time. During Samhain, the living could visit with the dead. Was well, this possible? You see, and that's what this whole holiday is based on. Based on the, the living dead, we could say. Well, that's the beauty of knowing the truth. Most of Christianity believes that the dead are living. And it's so easy to be misled and to walk down that, that, that horrible path. But we know, this is what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5, 6, and 10. For the living know they, that they will die, but the dead know nothing and they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love their hatred and their envy have now perished. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So if this is the case, if we really believe this, if we believe what the Bible says, why as a Christian would anybody even walk down that path? See, the problem is the devil has deceived the majority into believing that there's an immediate afterlife after this life. They don't believe what the Bible says about the dead. They don't believe what the Bible says about the resurrection. And they don't follow what the Bible says about staying away from these things. That's when we get into dangerous territory, when we're not following the word of God. I want you to notice the following. Uh, this was actually in the bulletin, but I took the percentages out. Among Americans, this is actually from uh, LifeWayResearch.com. It's a Christian organization, and they publish this. It says, among Americans, when you consider the pagan elements of Halloween, which is closer to your attitude? Now, this was just asking Americans, okay? You notice 59% say it's all in good fun. That's a lot. And then 21% try to avoid Halloween completely. 14% try to avoid the pagan elements. That's not very many. And then 6% are not sure. Where do you fall in that category? I fall in the 21 percentile. 
I avoid it completely. I don't try to. I do avoid it. So you ask, what do you do on Halloween? Well, I'm at home. I actually, rather than attract the people, I just turn the lights off, and that way I don't have the kids coming to the house. That's, just, that's a choice that Tanya and I have made. And, you know, we just, we actually, it's, it's actually a relaxing evening. If, if she's not working that evening, we usually just enjoy talking. And people have known, you know, they notice if the, if the lights are off. We haven't had our, nobody's rang our doorbell for years. I, I think it happened a couple of times at first, but they learn very quickly. So the question is, what should we be celebrating? What should we be celebrating? Let's look at the scripture reading for this evening found in Romans, or this morning found in Romans. I said evening, didn't I? I'm still stuck in the uh, Bible series week, I guess. Uh, Romans chapter 12. Brother Ed read this for us. This is such good advice and counsel. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's a beautiful text. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How can I renew my mind if I'm filling it with the garbage from this world? I can't. But if I'm, filling, if I'm filling it with God's Word, you know, if I've got idle time and I'm just taking in mindless TV, that's a way Satan can enter. He can. But if I've got idle time and I just say, you know, let me just see what God's Word has to say. This is a way that our Heavenly Father communicates with us. It's, it's really beautiful. So anything that has to do with the world. It says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. So that means that everything we do, we're coming before the Lord and we're, we're presenting ourselves to Him. So doing the will of God, we can celebrate Christ's death and communion. We can celebrate His resurrection because His Spirit comes into us. Because He's living now. We can celebrate the fact that God has given us a ministry that we can go out and share with others. We can celebrate the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. There are so many good things that come from being one of God's children. And I just ask that you, if you have friends, particularly even Christian friends, because a lot of people that aren't Christian, that don't have that bent toward the Bible, they don't care a lot of times. But if you have friends that you know are trying to live a good life and they, they believe the Bible, share some of these things with them if you see them going down that path and ask them, what's the purpose behind, why would you do that? A lot of times just, if you have a friend and you ask them that question, it can, it can persuade them to say, you know, you're right, I, I shouldn't be partaking. I shouldn't be doing these things. Don't be afraid, friends. Lives are at stake, and the devil's working hard to mislead everybody. So before you celebrate, think about what you should celebrate, and does it go along with the will of God?